Thanks for joining us, guys. This is Aaron Ramirez with the Local History and Genealogy Department. Uh, so Marcelo will be coming out in uh, in about 15 minutes. And in the meantime, we're just going to leave it on mute. Uh, so get yourself a snack and uh, settle in because it's going to be a, a great talk. Thanks.
Hey guys, thanks very much for your patience. We should get started in about 10 or 15 minutes. I appreciate it.
All right, guys, stay tuned. It's coming. Uh, make sure you got your coffee and your snacks, and we'll be get going here shortly. Finalist for the International Latino Book Award. 
He is also the author of the Poetry Book Sims Homesday, winner of the A. Coleman Jr. Prize Bow Editions, which was awarded the Great Lakes College Association Big Writer Award for Poetry, the 2019 Golden Poppy Award, and the Northern California Independent Bookstore Association, and the Fogart Hickey Book Bronze Prize for Best Book of the Year. And the accolades continue on for several pages more. Um, it, also, uh, it also mentions that uh, his first chapbook, chap Dulce, was winner of the Drinking Award Prize published by Northwestern University Press. He is a founding member of the Undocking Poets campaign, which successfully eliminated all citizenship requirements from every major first book prize in the nation, for which he received the Writer for Writers Award from Barnes and & Noble and Poets and Writers Magazine. He was the first undocumented student to graduate from the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan. Uh, a graduate of Punta Mundo Latinx Poetry Fellowship, he has also received fellowships to attend the Vermont Studio Center and the Community of Writers Workshop. He has taught at literary organizations such as Chautauqua Institution, Tin House, the Writers Center in DC, Cuba House in Seattle, 9291 New York City, and as was awarded the distinguished fellow position at the Marshall Project for the Justice Division from the University of Arizona, which had the case for prison reform. He served as a guest editor for Poem and Day Project from the Academy of Poets in the screen, and currently teaches the Creative Writing Program at the St. Mary's University in the Ashland Nova State MFA program, as well as poetry workshops for incarcerated youth in Northern California as the Yuba and Southern Suda Poetry so County Poet Laureate. So, as you can see, my friends, there's a lot of wonderful accolades, but and it is also housed in this beautiful book and this beautiful collection, which uh, my students and I have had the privilege of spending the last two weeks just immersing ourselves in, in Marcel's beautiful words. Um, this book made me cry at least twice, and because it's uh, it's inspiring, it's it's challenging, and it also speaks to so many of the important issues that are going on in our country. And I think you can see that clearly Marcelo is, is a heavyweight on the page, but also he's doing a lot of important literary citizenship and just activism that makes that really matters to our to our country and to our communities. So I'll stop there and I'll just you know, I'll stop gushing and I'll say without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marcelo Hernandez. Hi everyone. Oh. Testing the uh, sensitivity of these mics. So I put this, take a slot, so I won't have my books in front of me. Can everybody hear me okay? Now yeah, is there too much of an echo? No? Okay, cool. Um yeah, I mean this book made me crazy. <laughs> a lot. And uh it made me invest in therapy. <laughs> um, but I think, um, in all seriousness, I really want to thank everybody for being here, um, for inviting me and having such a warm welcome um, to Pueblo. I've never been to Pueblo, it's my first time in Pueblo, and I spent very little time in Colorado. Um, so it's, 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 really, um, it's, really, it's really meaningful to be here. Um, thank you for having me. And, uh, Maria. And everyone on the call in the organization because this has been kind of, it's not just like last week that we got it every year, it's like months and months and months. Um, so thank you for patience here, patience and bearing with me. We want to start, uh, I'm going to go kind of back and forth between my memoir and, um, Through my memoir and um, and the book of poems, I, I wrote them separately, but they're still a part of each other in a way that one is a continuation of the other. Um, um, yeah, I started in poetry and I was trained in poetry. Um, uh, that's me for me, for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess there were certain questions that I wasn't finished asking 
in the book of Romans. And for those of you writers in the room, um, you know, sometimes we have our sessions and we continue working on them in a second project, in a third, in a fourth, and I'll be writing about this long, long after, you know, um, hopefully immigration, um, migration, um, you know, uh, uh, mass displacement isn't in the news because that isn't happening anymore. Right? I'll be writing about it long after this in the news. Um, and so for me, there are questions in the book of poems that I couldn't necessarily speak through poetry that I needed to uh, think about in memoir, in prose, with the length of you know, the sentence rather than at the break of the line. Um, so, I guess this book documents my life, but also recent events that kind of add a different dimension to what's happening with um, immigration and um, the assaults on um, people who have not much power or not much say. Um, and one of it is the story of my mother, who, after 35 years in this country, exhausted all of her avenues for adjusting her status. After 35 years of living undocumented in this country, working every single day for those 35 years, not one single week, you know, taking a break, um, working in the fields, she exhausted. There's nothing else she could do. So her only other option was to return to settle, to finally find a place where she can retire. She's, she's um, uh, nearing her 70s. And, um, and so that's not a story, I guess, that is, is, is that common. Um, there was a lot of hurt, even though I was an adult, even though I had my own family. You're never, you never not meet your mom. Right? You never do not meet your mom. Even if she has passed, you still need her. You remember? So her return to Mexico really um, was, was, was the, one of the driving forces of the end book. Um, and, and, and just thinking of what that departure means for the majority of my family who would, would not be able to go and see her, right? Because of the immigration, because of documentation. So then, what is that kind of separation? And so I moved back in with her um, a few months before she, she was to depart. So I can uh, tie the things, get all this stuff, so moved out, and I worked on transition. So this is me, uh, and this is in 2015. Me and my mother's house. Back in her house, I brushed my mother's hair, which was soft and thin. She started dying it for the first time. Maybe that's why it felt so light in my finger. She always loved her gray hairs. She said it made her look refined, dignified, but not anymore. We sat on her couch late at night watching a Spanish dog, Steven Segal movie on the Mundo. With a terrible dog. Her arms were small, and I could feel her sharp bones dangle at the softest parts of her. I rubbed oil in her hair and kept brushing as we both laughed at Segal with those quick action camera angles and the infamous ponytail whipping back and forth. The explosions in the background of the movie, 20 years after it had been released, seemed faded, uneventful. As if by now, in our dim rooms, in the movie version, they were only pointing at the fire. It couldn't actually burn. I 
as if they were only saying vain but were muted. And Segal knew this. He was indifferent with his emotionless face, perhaps already aware, during filming, of the dim and fuzzy filter he would be seen through 20 years later in a dark room where a boy who was hardly a boy anymore was brushing his mother's hair. It was as if he knew that his voice would be replaced by the voice of a man speaking in heavy Castilian Spanish who had difficulty expressing surprise when a bomb exploded in his oh and ahs that which sounded more like soft moans. He didn't bother opening his mouth much to speak. She never had any knots in her hair, but it continued to brush. It wasn't defeat that was growing in the air each week. It was exhaustion. It was easier to brush her hair than to tell her I would miss her. I knew she would never return. Could we be blamed for giving up? There was an abscess on her arm, growing on her arm from a car accident about right here. It looked like a golf ball on her wrist, and it forced her to become left-handed. I remember her being mad at me as a teenager and saying, don't make me hit you with my foot <laughs> hand. It didn't hurt when she hit me, but I had to pretend that it did. What hurt most was just the fact that she hit me. The fact that she couldn't hit me with her right. The fact that she had to adjust her body sideways to hit me with her left. And that I stood there, unfazed, angry that I couldn't go out with my friends. The fact that it didn't hurt, but I cried in my bones. She was hit by a drunk driver. It's funny how those things happen, how one person can walk away without a scratch while the other is nearly sliced to pieces. If the lights were on in this room, with me brushing my mom's hair, and if I were looking at my mother for the first time, I would notice the remnants of that accident, the scars running down her neck, and the ones on her shoulder were small, Pieces of glass were tucked just beneath the skin and yet were lodged too deep. Uh, oh sorry, yet lodged too deep to extract, too large to dissolve into the rest of her. Because sometimes when foreign bodies are in the system, they sometimes either fall or they have glass, uh, shrapnel, or uh, storage from one. The largest scar ran down the length of her forearm, where they opened her and replaced all bones with metal. The metal would stay there, but the glass, the glass shards would not. At least, not all of it. The doctor said the shards would come out by themselves, unexpectedly, years later with minimal like a slow bullet traveling out of her, like a bullet in a film with an already outdated actor looking directly into the camera as he recites one author's like, I'm a bad motherfucker. I imagine the glass making its uneventful entrance into the world two decades later, as if it was alive squirming the way snakes do when they come out of their shell. Maybe it would be a lonely affair. No one there to see it, except a mom, who would surely 
be confused at first, seeing something deep her body. Or maybe I would be there to witness this thing that's been part of my mother's body for so long that it could be mistaken for bone. I wouldn't know how to hold it with the felt in my hands. I would put it to my ear and listen. I would hold it to the light before giving it back to my mom so she could know what it was that hurt her every time she lifted her arm to me. Um, I have a bit of a slideshow, um, I guess not slideshow, but um, just some pictures to uh, go along. Um, when she, in the months that she was going to depart, um, I returned. Because by then I had established my permanent site. By then I had established my permanent residency. Um, I'm gonna turn one off and see if that's okay. Is that is that really okay? Oh, that's actually better. It's not going to the network. Okay, cool. Um, I have to, I returned to my to my um, to my hometown. Um, because my father had been there, he'd been deported uh, uh, 15 years prior, or 10 years prior, I'm sorry. Um, I was 15 when he, when he was deported, and, um, and when I returned to see him, I was 25. So, I was a child, and I was a man. I came back, um, Mary, and she's into my wife, and so we returned to his house to prepare it for my mother, to prepare for her arrival. I wanted to make it cute. I wanted to lessen the pain so that she had a bathroom adjoining her bedroom, so she wouldn't have to go outside into the patio. So they had, you know, um, warm water, so we have to we have to buy like these um, these uh, uh, solar solar things to, to, to heat up water. Um, you know, we have to put down tiles so it would be dusty, like she hates dust, she hates dust. And, um, and my town is, in, is an arid mountain town, I mean, similar to this, um, actually, and it's, it's very dusty in the summers. Um, so me, I, I, I had to go and kind of scope, have my dad change. He was still a better, he was a better So, yes, it was to prepare my mother's house. <coughs> For her arrival, make it nice and cute. Get her, get her uh, a nice fridge, a new stove, a new washing machine. And my dad would be like, "Why do we need a washing machine? I have this one in the washing machine." Falling apart. Just continuously was like, "Why do we need this? Why do we need that? Why have you not done this thing for me in the ten years that I've been here by myself?" That's me. That's the smallest picture that I have. And um, I'm gonna actually read something adjoining to this, and I wasn't going to. I wasn't planning on doing this. I might not even find it, so if that doesn't happen. I guess that's okay. Um, but it's about a horse um, because I I almost died uh, on the horse. Um, my father my father put me on a horse to take my picture, and the horse got spooked and ran away with me on its back as fast as lightning can go. Uh, just terrified of this little this little bundle just hanging on to its mane and just like causing it more pain because of that and just running faster and faster because of that. Now, um, but you know my, my mom um, basically just went into the house back into the house with my son's gun. Um, and so uh, that wasn't this time here, but this is, uh, so he would like to dress me up and put me back on a horse. And, um, and that just made me look at both. Um, 
Each pepper field is the same. In each one, I am a failed anthem. I don't know English, but there's so little that needs translated out here. For 12 hours, I have picked the same pepper. Still, I don't know what country does that belong to. My skin is peeling. Cuál Dios quisiera ser fuente. If only I could choose what hurts. My inheritance to those lost mothers bound to the future of their blood. I'm walking again in the footage where the white dress loses its shape. Even moving my hands to sort the peppers is a kind of running. Hold still. The child will sing because I was once her blind. She will take my picture, both bloom and bride, a country she has never seen. I will give her the night to make her own camera. And I'm only half sick, being sick is just a bone waiting to harden. I could be a saint, since there exists no pleasure that wasn't first abandoned to us out of boredom. We traffic in the leftovers of ecstasy. How lonely and inventive those angels were. If I could speak their language, I will tell them all my real name, Antonia. And with my curved knife, I will break them of all the figures. Um, this is my father's house. He, like I said, again, he liked horses. He was a, a rancher, a kettle, and I wanted to soften his house. He liked exposed dirt, um, which is like trendy here, but like in Mexico, the other exposed dirt is like a symbol of like status of, you know, you couldn't afford to foster. But um, we worked very hard for this house. He built this house um, in spite of, I guess, our. Uh, absence. So yes, we grew up with a single mom, but my dad, they were technically you know, separate because he was deported and I just knew him by phone. Um, and the occasional picture that our family cousins would bring back from Mexico. Like, look, you did that. Um, so I'll read up a poem about my father. <coughs> My book is um, this is the first this is the book that I that I read that I have always read from since its publication. And so like it no longer exists as one thing. Um, because I've read from it so so much. Um, uh, 
that was on our flight back, uh, uh, on, our, uh, uh, on our, my return actually, the first time that I, that I would have data and was able to go see my phone. Um, and I, I just had a few things to grind in the shower with over. <laughs> My father, this is called sugar. My father's hands split peaches in half and fed me. Mouth and nail, salt and a little kiss. Always the leather, always my ass bleeding with welts, my ass purple with love. Always the bell to be called Daisy. And I said, hello, Daisy. And she said, hello. And he bent over the sink with his palms in his face. And he, the only tunnel of song for miles in any direction, the white belt, Daisy, and Daisy, and Daisy. And after it's over, we know we have both become them. Him for the being, and me for taking the being. I love you, Daisy. I say to God. My father's hands will love a man at the first sign of weakness. I am weak. Or I gather that he loves me. Their suffering was our suffering. They peeled the skin off the lamb. It was still breathing. I remember its cry, but not the real that we made from it. His hands were two doves courting the lamb, which was also a dove in its thrashing. They cut through the air like ghosts that were large and capable of great things. I always came when they called. They always had peaches to put in my mouth. I love my father, but it's been different. When he was deported, I was 15 and it was a very controlling hospital. So, another narrative you don't get here is um, the Uvisa narrative in which uh, victims of, of, of violent crimes um, are those who receive women of residence status if they cooperate with one of them. Um, but when he, when, he, when he was gone, I was kind of happy. You know, I was like, I didn't know the future. But I didn't know then that even with all these problems, like I was still new to that. To figure stuff out, to learn how to do it. I remember the whispers from me. Um, my goal today is to find that, that part. Of, um, I wish I had my own book better. There's, uh, there's parts that I've never read from, it just happens to be. Um, I'll look it up uh, actually. Um, yeah, uh, I got DACA in um, 2012 when it was first passed by uh, President Obama. And uh, as, soon as, as, soon as, as soon as that happened, I um, I returned to Mexico again to see my, my, my dad for the first time in 10 years. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's my favorite uh, return. Okay, how am I on time? Um, I could read this last and then how about QA? Um, okay, cool. Um, and 
so it, it was a it was a return, you know, to home. I don't know if any of you have returned to a home, either a birth that you have returned to, or a place that you've been told this is your home. This is where we come from, whether that's you know two miles away or two thousand miles away. Um, but all returns are 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 difficult. Um, all returns kind of. Uh, Come with expectations and failed expectations, right? You're expecting like a warm welcome, and then something just like, you know, you get better. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna read this for you about, I guess, the return. On the plane, this exact thing. I wonder. If there was an exact point when we were no longer in one country and inside another. Or if there was ever a moment when we occupied no country. If ever that was possible, it was possible up in the air. There was no clear correlation between what was happening down there, down below, and up above. I had heard that the official port of, port of entry in Tijuana, there were turnstiles, carnival style, subway style, just like the subway, ushering travelers forward. If such turnstiles existed, you could map the precise moment when half of your body was here and the other half was there. I could measure all I wanted was that little gold stamp that said, I clicked past onto the other side. I entered, I returned, I was measured, counted for, recorded, mattered. Would a sudden coldness come over, come over us when our bodies moved over the actual line of the border? Wasn't that how loneliness began with the coldness of our bodies? I tried to keep the border from, you know, I was just mesmerized by trying to know exactly where it was at at all times. And it was very obvious. It disrupts the landscape in a very jarring and violent way because it's a straight line. Straight lines don't usually happen in nature. Right? Straight lines are some, is, is a human invention. I mean, it's rare. Crystals have the lines of nine degree angles. Um, but it's not natural to the landscape and it stands out. When I came undocumented to the US at the age of five, I crossed into a threshold of invisibility. Every act of living became an act of trying to remain visible. I was negotiating a simultaneous absence and presence that was begun by the act of my displacement. I tried to remain seen for those whom I desired to be seen by, and I wanted to be invisible to everyone else. Or maybe I was trying to control who remembered me and who forgot me, but I couldn't control what someone else saw in me, only persuade them that it wasn't an illusion. There were things about me I could not hide. I was afraid of the way I walked. It was easy to imagine being hit by a car, because even if they didn't see me, I would for once be able to feel my body as more than smoke. I did get hit by a car actually once. I think it did. Um, and it's in the book, but, um, but the woman who hit me uh, felt really bad, and I, and I did feel bad for her. She visited me in the hospital and brought me a, uh, uh, some muffins. Um, and she said, sorry, and you know, brushing up against the, any kind of authority, any, any official that are informed, even though the hospital is not a place of authority where law enforcement is preoccupied, it's still a substitute for authority. And so it's still something that is feared for what might happen. And so we just wanted her to go away. And we just said, thank you, thank you for the moments. Thank you. 
I'm so sorry. We're the ones who apologize. Um, no, this is a very good notice. There's nothing to worry about. My son, this, this, this book here is about uh, the difficulties of, of, of trying to have a child, me and my wife. Um, we've worked many, many years uh, trying and, and, and not, not being successful. Um, and so the book is about child loss um, and you know, what it means to bring a, to bring a child into this, into this world. And um, lo and behold, he came. He's uh, six now, no, five, this was past year, but it's still great. He's a little too. His name is Julian, after my grandmother. Um, I think I'll just end with one more. Okay. We're good? Sure. And then we'll do questions. And yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to go take this back to, to a printer somewhere and just, um, and just talk to you about this. Okay, so this is a um, century of good metal with three critters. And I guess this is for my son because he's coming into this world, into a, into a world in which he's also negotiating race, in which he's going to be negotiating. Like, he's, even he's not done with the questions that I am still trying to do, right? Even he is not done with the unfinished matters of my mother, my dad, of my grandfather, who died somewhere in the desert and has never been recovered. It's been now 70 years ago. Um, so I think about the next generation, and I think about you know, how I grew up. I mean, I'm even ashamed of like my darkness. Because colorism is very prevalent in the Latino communities. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Century of good metal with three prayers. My skin is darker than the flag burning in the man's mouth. Soy a campanada, rezando por las estrellas. Everything is larger than the mother's god of grief. Everything is to the left of her. But the son focuses on the sleep. But who am I to the guns painted for the young? How large the paper kites have grown over their faces, as if the riddle was meant to be answered. Let this be the last time a boy like me cuts himself open, trying to find, trying to find the swans flapping their wings inside him. Let this be the last time they appear, unfolding their large wings in his chest. Not move as if to say, I will not hurt you. Afraid the smallest threat will scare them away.
your feelings best. Spanish and music, English and music. Spanish if it's in a song, in a cry, in a Romanian first language. I think mean, it's still the only language that is left over from when you did have that cry before language. Right? We cry before we knew the words to cry. We cry we, we, we shed tears before we knew that it was a word, the thing that was coming out of our bodies. So I think mean, for me, it's attached to that pre-language. And so for me, English then is the, 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 the medium by which I'm continually trying to return to not that not Spanish in like the linguistic sense, but Spanish in the in the the, the first sense that that um, was the key, I guess before we knew language. If you have and you were born to another with the with the first language that you acquired before language is like what are the questions that the second or third language are trying to ask? And what are they trying to retrieve that maybe has been lost? I know a lot of things have been lost because um, because of my acquisition of language, of English. A lot of things were lost. So then in the poems of your mother and your father, mm -hmm. have you also written them in Spanish too? No. Too painful. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's the language that I, that I can best express. I mean, um, yes, Spanish is my first language, but English is my dominant language. So in, in the future, what, what do you uh, aspire to? I mean, do you have like a goal uh, language-wise for your work that, uh, that it would be? No, I mean, um, my mother doesn't know a bit of English, but she went to literacy classes at the library and has translated this entire book. Uh, so I look for it in Spanish soon. As soon as I can, you know, my agent, I just put it in my Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be around to the like, lecture chat afterwards to uh, design some books and stuff. So my question is um, about your son. Yeah. Um, now, you know, you grew up living in the shadows, yeah. so to speak, you know, your mother ended up back in Mexico yeah. uh, with our present political environment where they're uh, trying to get rid of DACA. Yeah. And do you see your son uh, going through the same kind of experience you did, even though he was he was born in this country, I'm assuming, but, but the present political environment to say yeah. that DACA, all, you know, they're getting rid of DACA, so that will affect your son. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, he's, uh, we've been trying to do this for 100 years. The first person that I could track down that uh, immigrated to the U.S. was my great grandfather in 1916. And he's doing the exact, he was doing the exact same thing we're trying to do now. Like, uh, which is why there's so many so problems with everyday field simulation. Who is able to assimilate, and for whom is the act of assimilation of violence uh, would be very seen. So I think my son and I continue to deal with um, a lot of the same issues in different ways, um, in different ways that I did, but that speaks to like mixed status families that people who were born here or who have parents who are undocumented, like a sister, um, they're, not, they're not like excluded from the trauma of separation. Because just because they're citizens doesn't mean that their entire family can stay, right? They're vicariously living through the, through the, through the hyper-awareness that the mother is living through. But in that state of helplessness, because you can't do anything about it. Like, I wish I could just give my, 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 my visa to like, my cousin. I wish I could just, when I got my permanent residency card, like, it wasn't a celebration. It was just a day of sorrow because I said, I don't deserve this. There's so many more people that need this more than me. Like, why did I, why did I look out, right? Um, so, like, for my son, I, I, I really want to instill that, like, that he isn't helpless. Um, It'll be 
really hard. He's a bright kid. He's super bright kid. Very, very Thank you. Thank you so much for your words. Thank you for this book. You started this talk out um, jokingly saying that the book made you cry as well, and then it forced you to invest in therapy. So maybe you did that for me too. <laughs> um, as I was reading it, my my teenage daughter asked me, Oh, what are you reading? I was like, I don't know, one of the most triggering things I think I've ever <laughs> put in my hands. And it was um, for me that whole section of the book when you um, return to Mexico to see your, your dad after your separation. And, oh, God, it was just, like, so vivid to me, not because I have been separated from my own father, but because of how you described your dad. It was almost like I could smell him the way you described him, like how that communication, there was something there that wasn't free flowing between the two of you. Yeah. And um, how you were so open and honest about when you could call on the phone and your mom would be on the phone like telling you like, no, tell her I'm in the bathroom, tell her I'm not. And I could almost like just see these characters just embedded within myself. And the idea of like, um, seeing your dad in a vulnerable state, yeah. you know, when you go into the hotel room that's, that's next to yours, and God, there were so many layers there. Like, you, you didn't want you all to share one room, and you used your wife as an excuse as to why you didn't want to share this room, and you could, it was almost tangible when you talked about how he was laying on the bed in his uh, shirt and his underwear, and there's like this intimacy, this familial intimacy that happens, and you were like afraid to open yourself up to that familiarity with your dad. Yeah. It was just really triggering in all these good and bad ways, and I loved the way you just so simply shared that. It was almost as if it didn't need a lot of flourishing words to describe it. I think if anybody has a relationship with their dad that's layered or complicated and has a relationship with their mom that's also layered and complicated, you you can grasp onto that. But there was a really big cultural element to that too. Yeah. If you have a dad and you're, a, if you're from a Latino family, there is a certain amount of a communication very, very big yeah. that's there. I don't want to put that in words yeah. exactly, yeah. but it was, it was, it was yeah. touching. Maybe triggering, we'll see. I'll, I'll hit you up if I need some funds for, for therapy. <laughs> Thank you so much, love. It was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that's was beautiful. I'm, I'm so uh, touched that you resonated with that. Um, and, I, and I hope that as the book has a mystery, that it's also um, uh, shared to me. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you don't know somebody, like, you're almost afraid of, like, uh, the precariousness of your relationship makes you not want to invest. Because you know if you invest into this and it's broken, then you're just going to, like, you. Like, like, I don't want to get too attached. But I, I want him to be in his own hotel room. I don't know. I don't want to know what his toothbrush looks like. I don't want to know um, if he... Uh, I don't want to know on what side of the bed he sleeps on. I did, but at the same time, you know, to protect myself and my, and my, and my emotional health, like, um, about the day before his immigration interview, not twice. So the next day, he would have either gladly crossed over into a bustle, or we would have gone to the bustle, he would have returned. And so he is, he got his uh, application to be rejected. So, I guess my instincts were there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, maybe, yeah. uh, thank you for being here. And I want to thank Maria for allowing uh, us to be here in the program. Uh, in your opening, you 
you spoke about um, issues that matter to your society now. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering um, how you uh, experience racism as you uh, write about that, I don't remember your words, and uh, how it has affected you. Yeah. The question was, you know, about because you your life in, uh, I don't know if I didn't understand correctly, is how you negotiate your life in which you know, you're reminded of the color of your skin or um, in which you're in constant negotiations um, with race. And, you know, I, I, my students, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor, and, um, and I have this conversation with my students a lot is that race is, is if, you, if you feel like race doesn't matter, then what you're saying is like, then then you don't see me. Like, I don't see race, well, then you don't see me. You don't see people of color. So um, for me, I have those conversations. Um, and, you know, in, in Latino communities, there's a lot of stigma of anti blackness and anti indigenous um, And so you have, like, like I used to really, like, um, uh, I think romanticize Mexico and romanticize Spanish and romanticize uh, the culture in a way that really did factor in that Mexico is also, in fact, America is also a colonial country, settler colonial countries, that Spanish is also a settler colonial language, speaks in, in a lot of the same traditions that perpetuated, you know, and was violence. So I think I want to, I guess, be aware of my complicity each and every day. That, you know, um, not like that, that quote, uh, um, uh, your your silence is complicity, it's, it's an unquote quote, but like um, uh, saying something like if, if you try to ignore it, that's also like doing something that is in the same way, perpetually the same kind of violence. So, you know. It doesn't have to be much. We, uh, as as Kwan was mentioning, the Dr. Poets uh, Collective uh, organization that I founded and uh, run, we just um, like we just uh, uh, convinced the Pulitzer Prize to change all of the requirements of citizenship. For how long have the Pulitzer been? It's like the most prestigious prize to win of the Nobel here in the, in the U.S. Um, and I caught on a Zoom call with somebody in the Pulitzer uh, board, and, and they said, so who's your PR team? They're obviously like, you got your shit together, right? Who's, who have you talked to? I was like, it's just us three. Like, this is it. Like, <laughs> um, it was just a, bunch of, a few texts back and forth, some Google Docs, sharing a few Google Docs, and like, that was enough to, um, to like change the, the so, so for me it's like how do I can negotiate your race? It's not like some some grand under uh, 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 so, so some grand gesture that takes you know funding and an HR department and, and doing all of this. No, literally it's me and my other co-organizers, three people total, <coughs> back and forth, and we can have sign on. So, um, and it's that's all it took. So really, it's it's not it's not too difficult to, to enact a lot of change with very little resources. You just gotta know how to like, how to use the right voice. Which is what someone said. You know, uh, you can curse is fine, but like choose the right words that like, is almost better. Okay. <laughs> Are you okay with time unless there's? Um... I think we're good. But do, do we have any more questions? And I won't answer long. <laughs> I'm not going to Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it means a lot. Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for coming. We do have committees, so please help yourself. And tomorrow, I'm going to ask Michael Espinosa to stand. He is our other Latino festival author and